that was my reaction and and there were times that i when i would read the quran i would cry literally based on data latinos are the fastest growing ethnic group i saw the muslims bowing and prostrating on their faces immediately lit up the light bulb in my head and i said man I love this. But two years into my journey, I'm learning that Latino and Latina Muslims like me are not as uncommon as I once thought. Especially you guys up there in the back, <laughs> referring to the Arab guys, yeah. as in John 17, 3, and this is life eternal, so they may know you, the only true God. And your teacher gives you a book on Salahuddin. That is right. Tell us about that. Now as a Muslim Eddie. I can understand the, what, the words of Jesus even much better than when I was a Catholic. Yo soy hondureño. Yo soy musulmán. Y yo les aconsejo de buscar el Islam. Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters, as you can see, alhamdulillah, we've gotten the property, we're getting right to work, we're not officially open. That's where you guys come in to help us to officially open, to accomplish the goal of opening the first mega Dawa center in Masjid, phase two. Here, go ahead and do your part. Donate right now so we can accomplish this goal. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, greetings and peace. Welcome to the Dean Show. I'm Eddie, your host. Did you know that Latinos continue to be the fastest minority group coming to Islam? And I have one of those Latinos here with me today from Honduras. He was born in a Catholic family, went on to study many, with many different Christian denominations, even sat with, uh, in many study circles with the Jehovah's Witnesses, played a, um, in a play the role of Jesus, who was so dear to his heart. He also went on to join the Navy ROTC. Somewhere in the midst of all this, he got to hate in Islam. And later on, he ended up meeting some Muslims. What happened from there that he's on the Dean Show to share his wonderful story on how he went from being someone who hated Islam and Muslims to being here on the Dean Show. We have one God, His name's Allah, Allah And His final message is Muhammad Peace be upon Him This is our religion, Islam, Islam This is the Deen Show when I was ready to talk about it, I would only talk to Yas and I was explaining how much respect I have for the faith of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. So, Neil Fernando Castro. Correct. Yes, but you go by. Abdul Rahman. Abdul Rahman, which means the the servant of the most merciful. Beautiful, and uh, you're from Honduras. That is correct. And this is uh, Central America. Yes. What other we have surrounding? What like uh, Guatemala and uh, El, Salvador, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Nicaragua. Yes. And uh, you were telling me that this area here is a very small population of Muslims. That is correct. That is uh, until this day probably about one percent still of the entire population let's get into this news clip because i opened up and i said amongst the latinos islam is the fastest growing religion and i want to get your take on this sure when i first heard the call to islam as a chicano i thought i was alone but two years into my journey i'm learning that latino and latina muslims like me are not as uncommon as i once thought based on data latinos are the fastest growing ethnic group embracing islam in america Jaime Mujahid Fletcher is a Colombian-American who embraced Islam 21 years ago. Soon, his father also wanted to learn about the religion, and Jaime had a hard time finding educational material that was written in Spanish. That effort grew into Islam in Spanish, an Islamic center that doesn't convert Latinos and Latinas, but provides educational information about the religion in Spanish. Jaime says they've seen an explosion of Latino and Latina converts. People just show up and they say, hey, we're coming here to embrace Islam. So what did you think about this uh, report here? It's uh do you see that happening? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Do you th do you see these numbers this is more in this is more in America or are you seeing this also in your home country where you were originally from Honduras and these other in Central America? 
Um, I see this mostly here in the United uh -huh. States. Is, is that why? Because there's more exposure to Islam? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Because uh, here in this country, you know, there's more uh, liberalism, there's more freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the people, they have the freedom, you know, to basically to, uh, to choose and get exposed to many different types of, you know, isms and yeah. religions. How about in Honduras? How is that? It's primarily Catholic? The majority is Catholic and then is divided into subgroups of Christianity such as Protestantism yeah. and uh, other subgroups. Um, Islam is considered one of the minority groups recognized mm -hmm. uh, amongst, uh, you know, a few. Mm -hmm. So, but your your background is also from your, fa your parents both uh, yeah. practicing Christians, Catholicism, that yeah. is correct. Yeah, you were also practicing. Christian? I was very practicing, yes. Yeah, C can you kind of outline some of the daily rituals? We know in Islam we have the five pillars. We pray five times a day minimum, fasting, Ramadan, Hajj, you know, so you know the breakdown. What's kind of a breakdown if for a Christian living in in, um, in Central America who's practicing Christianity? What does it look like? Is it for everyone it's kind of different or is it the same? For a Muslim, it's pretty straight, straightforward. Yeah. It's pretty straight. It's the same, right? Right. The, uh, but how is it in Central America with uh, the Catholics? Well, mainly for Catholics, since I was a practicing one, uh, Catholics would uh, basically go to church. Yeah. Mainly on Sunday Mass. Yeah. In the morning and in the night. Apart from the uh, those other uh, rituals such as Easter, when it would come at the be in the month of March or so, I would partake in Easter in the past what is called the Passion of Christ, the dramatization of the crucifixion of Christ and the death and all of these things, and the resurrection. I would be part of those things, uh, as well as uh, you know, study uh, uh, groups and worship groups mm -hmm. that we would hold because I, I grew up very close you know through my female relatives my aunt uh, my grandmother my great-grandmother these were you know they were religious people at that time in their days yeah and so by watching them that's how I grew very close to Catholicism mm -hmm. in practice. okay so then at what age you actually did you come to America when I first came to America I was uh, about probably between eight and ten years old yeah was that role that you played as jesus was that back in in honduras yes but that was uh when i was about 13 years old okay so you really had an affinity a really a connection with your at that time with your religion yes and even playing the role of jesus and um so you you would go to church you would go through the the communion the communion you were baptized what at Six, I was at six years old. I was six baptized. Six years old. Six yeah. years old. Wow. All right. So then you come here to America, and at what you even were at some t you were going to different denominations at the same time, sitting with evangelicals, and even sat with some some Jehovahs came that knocking on your door one time. That is correct. Yeah. Especially because they were Latin um, and Latin Americans, and Spanish speaking. So um, at that time, I was living with I was still living with my parents in their home. And uh, I would invite them. And I would sit down with them, read the Bible, and study with them, their, with, you know, with their, uh, their magazines and stuff, which, called, which in English is called Watchtower. Uh, in Spanish it's called Atalaya. And so I, would, I spent a, a good amount of time with them, re uh, reading and trying to understand. But uh, I never, you know, they never tried to convince me to become a Jehovah Witness, even though I was still a Catholic, and they knew it. Mm-hmm. And what what was it uh, when you would sit with other denominations and whatnot? What what was everything? What was the your what were you inspiring to to learn more? Did you have doubts at that time that you had to go and sit with other uh, other denominations or other sects of Christianity? Mm -hmm. Was there something missing? No, in fact, that's a very good question that you ask because uh, as Prior, way prior to my Islam, to ever finding Islam, I never, never encountered any doubts. I never questioned the Trinity or never questioned whether Jesus, why Jesus is God or why people think so or why the Virgin Mary is considered the mother of God or these sorts of things. Yeah. 
I never had any doubts concerning it. Mm -hmm. No, not at all. Not at all. Oh. So then you're going on through life, you're here, and then how did uh, you end up with this? Because you didn't know anything about Islam. That is correct. Yeah, but then you somehow ended, then you ended up hating it. You didn't know anything. Like a lot, most people, they end up, when you talk to them, they know nothing except what the media usually tells them or some hate preacher or some person who poisons their minds. Yeah. And the, then you fell into that, uh, into that uh, trap now. You ended up hating Islam, but you didn't know nothing about it. Exactly, out of ignorance. Out of ignorance. Because huh? I saw, like you say, you know, the media outlets portraying hatred towards these people towards this religion that are yeah. associated with terrorism uh-huh yeah so tell me this uh went on for some time you had a an incident where you gave up you, you got in front of the cl your class is that correct that is correct tell us about that uh this was right right after um after high school yeah after high school yeah and then you were saying that that's kind of when the hatred really it uh came. it sipped into my heart yeah, yeah. Yeah, that happened uh, in 2001, mm -hmm. uh, right when 9-11 actually happened. Yeah. I was in, in community college, and uh, I entered in the morning, right, a, into the cafeteria. Always that was my routine. Go to the cafeteria, grab a snack, grab a soda to drink, and then go to class, to my yeah. first class. So as soon as I enter, I see a television, and the first thing I see is breaking news. America under terrorist attack. The Twin Towers were burning. I stood there, just paying attention, looking at it. And I said, eh. Went to grab my things to the machines, went to my class. Later that day, I mean afternoon, I went to English class. My English teacher is the one who broke the news, everybody, you know. If, uh, are you aware, you know, what's going on right now in New York? in Washington DC, you know, two airplanes crash into New York City and there's a terrorist attack. If any one of you knows anyone on those towers or have any family members or friends, and if you would like to come up and say something, you can please do so. That's how, that was a very emotional shaking day. Girls in the class, they were very emotional, very, you know, they were with tears, crying and everything. At that time, right after, you know, because I graduated high school, I had that patriotism in my heart because I was in the Navy ROTC in high school, four years, and I loved it and I wanted to join the real Navy. So when everybody had finished doing, you know, their, 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 their expressing their emotions, you know, and their feelings, my teacher says, anybody else would like to come up and say something? I raised my hand. Neil. Do you have any relatives? Do you know anybody on the Twin Towers? I said, no. Would you like to come up? And I said, yes. I went up into the front. And before I was about to make my impromptu speech, four guys, four Muslim guys, Arab guys, come in into the class. They go sit to the back of the classroom. They start talk talking to each other, you know, in their language. And so I said, basically, I know that, you know, I had no idea that this is going on. I saw it on the TV, but I had no idea what was going on. But not un until, you know, our teacher exposes the news to us. Now I have an understanding of what's, what's happening to us. So I said, whatever I am going to say is not to offend anybody, especially you guys up there in the back, <laughs> referring to the Arab guys. Yeah. And so my impromptu speech was, whoever did this to us is going to pay. That was my impromptu speech, my short words, to the point, whoever did this to us is going to pay. Because I felt the patriotism and the love for, you know, for America. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on this one, the, you know, the hatred for these people, these terrorists, or this religion they're associated with, entered into my heart. Yeah. I felt like I became an enemy to this religion. Yeah. Out of ignorance. Out of ignorance, yeah. Wow. Uh, even though um, obviously Islam has nothing to do with such evil actions, nor does anyone who's practicing Islam as a, as a Muslim. Yeah. And it's uh, it's amazing that so many people they ended up from this sad and tragic 
event that happened. You had so many people fall into this hate yeah. like you fell into. Yeah. But then what's interesting, you end up in a humanities class and your teacher gives you a book on Salahuddin. That is right. Tell us about that book. So basically that was the novel that she gave us. My teacher was from Chile. I remember her, but I forgot her name. And she was a very intelligent woman. And she, so this is the book that she gives us all, every student in the class. So this is the novel that we're going to read. And I see the, the, the title, Salah Udin, by Tariq Ramadan, Professor Tariq Ramadan. Everybody's aware with, uh, of him. I believe he, you interviewed him as well. Uh, I think he resides either in France or in the UK. And so we went through this novel, you know, uh, written by him. And uh, very interesting. It ex you know, it was a novel, of course, uh, but of the details that I really, you know, can remember, you know, <laughs> it's not much, but I remember she, she would give us a chapter uh, and, 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 and we were supposed to, you know, explain what we read and everything. <laughs> I actually embarrassed myself in that day because I, d I forgot to do my reading. And, uh, but anyways, it was, uh, other than that, it was just enjoyable. It was an enjoyable thing and I got exposed to Islam through this. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, you know, I came to Islam through stages. Yeah. And Allah, I didn't know Allah was preparing me and was showing me the way that this thing had to do with Islam. These particular people had to do with Islam. In the back of my mind, in my subconscious, I had no idea that anything of this has to do with this religion called Islam. So then Salahuddin Ayyubi, I mean, this is a um, very historic figure. And you see him, there's actually Hollywood, they even made a movie. Right. What was it uh, called again? It's, it's called The Kingdom of Heaven. Kingdom of Heaven. Did you see that movie? Yes, I did. I that did. was interesting. They actually portrayed it properly. Yeah. Somewhat where he actually, uh, do you remember? You want to share what, what happened in that movie? Do you remember the... So basically uh, in the movie... Salahuddin is the one who mobil mobilized the Muslims to open Jerusalem again and to retake it from the uh, Christians who basically had established you know, their kings and, and, and the kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh -huh. uh, and so Salahuddin is basically considered the hero, one of the greatest heroes after, I would say, the companion of the prophet, Khalid. Ibn al-Walid, who was called the Sword of Allah, mm. who is considered even by the non-Muslims the most, one of the most successful generals in history. They study his life, yeah. Yes, never. He never failed. He never, he never lost a battle, as far as I'm concerned, throughout his life. Mm -hmm. So then, Salahuddin, he ends up retaking. That was what was the uh, the magnanimous thing about this conquest now that he when he came in he could have just destroyed everybody right yeah that and is then, correct and then what happened so so when Salahuddin basically he all op finally opened Jerusalem and the Christian defenders of Jerusalem they basically agreed to a truce a pact of peace with Salahuddin that they will give up the city mm -hmm at the exchange of them letting them live, the soldiers that were there, and the Christians living in the city. And Salahuddin, out of his you know, greatness and magnanimity as a ruler, as a warrior, he agreed that he would give safety and safe passage to all the Christians that wanted to leave the city into the Christian lands. Yeah. And this is following the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be, and blessings be upon him, who at that time when the pagans, they had tortured, they had done all sorts of evil towards the, the Muslims yeah. the, and those who were worshiping one and only one God. When he came and conquered in Mecca, over 10,000 strong, this also was a chance for him to take revenge. But he didn't take revenge. He spread the peace, spread the food. And then Salahuddin following that same example of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Correct. Yeah, so nobody was terrorizing the people. But actually, they were the ones terrorized, but when they had a chance now to come back and inflict suffering and torment right. and terrorize people because they were terrorized and they were oppressed and all sorts of evil was done to them, 
they chose the way of mercy, right. and forgiveness. Right, exactly. And this is what I read as well when in in my uh, year, my two one and a half year or so. Mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, between 2003 and 2004 in my learning before becoming a Muslim. Yeah. When I, I read about, you know, Islamic history particularly, mm -hmm. and uh, this has to do also with my name, Abdurrahman, that I yes. chose, that, you know, Salahuddin, according to the historians of his time, Salahuddin, he loved to follow the Prophet in two things, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may the peace and blessings so. of Allah be upon the Prophet Muhammad and his family and companions. One of those mm -hmm. things was Salahuddin. He would spend his wealth in charity. And number two, he would also seek knowledge, mm -hmm. be around the scholars. And number three, this is the third point too that I have to add, he loved to follow the Prophet in jihad. Mm -hmm. For those who do not know, the word jihad doesn't mean holy war. Jihad simply means in in English to strive and to struggle for the for the sake of Allah in the path of Allah and mm -hmm. what is good. And so Salahuddin he used to do these three things and follow the Prophet very keenly on these three things. So you started to get to know all these things. You sat with a Muslim at one point. So you came to Islam in stages. Things were just brought to you here, there, and then you had the Salahuddin book, that was one stage, and now you end up meeting a Muslim and he's actually going over the six articles of faith, he's explaining the five, he's explaining Islam, removing yeah. some of the misconceptions that you had. Tell us about this stage. Okay, that happened uh, further down into, uh, somewhere in 2003, when I began doing uh, valet parking in downtown Chicago. And so uh, the brother's name is Damir, and until this day I am in communication with him. And I would always greet him. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, uh, when I the I was acquainted with him through a period of time. So at this time, I really didn't reach to you know the point where hey, I'm interested in Islam. What is Islam? Yes. No. At at that time, 2003. I mean, 2000. Yeah, 2003. Um, I don't want to equivocate myself. The terrorism. The topic of terrorism and Islam and anything that had to be related with so-called terrorism was still a hot topic in the minds of people unfortunately yeah and how I came to that point was that I, I heard another co-worker of mine two co-workers of mine one Muslim who joined us later on and he was talking to another guy a Mexican guy who looked like Jay Leno mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the guy Mexican guy was I, against you know this Muslims this terrorist and all of this and all of that and the thing that stuck in my mind was the word terrorism. So at one point of time, I was with you know with the other uh, the other Muslim guy, whose his name was Khan, and I asked him, Khan, I overheard you speak with Javier, and he was mentioning the word terrorism. So I overheard you and Javier, and he was saying this Muslim, this terrorist, terrorism, and this is the only word that stuck in my mind. I said, Khan, can you please explain to me what is terrorism? Because I don't know. So the guy, unfortunately, as smart as he was, he couldn't give me a clear definition of what terrorism is. So I said, no, let's go to Damir when we go back. And so we did. We went to Damir. So at that time, all three of us were very acquainted now. And so he said, Damir, here's this young man, Neil. He has a question for you. And Damir being the nice guy that he is, he says, Neil, what is your question? I said, Damir, and I told him the story. And so I said, can you please tell me what is terrorism? I don't know. And so he said, sure. So he brought the definition by Nico Pelev, who is a Israeli pro-Palestinian uh, activist mm -hmm. advocating pa uh, Palestinians. And so he gave me the definition as terrorism is the weapon of the weak. I said, how? He said, when powerful nations enter the, 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 the other nations, weaker nations, and they attack them, and they destroy everything, and they take you know, whatever they have, the people, in order to fight back, they only take the means that they have, what is available to them. And so they use that as a weapon to fight back, and this is how terrorism is the weapon of the weak. 
I said, okay. I guess it made sense to me. And so Damir said, Neil, are you interested? What do you know about Islam? Are you interested in learning about Islam? I said, yeah, because I was an open-minded person. Now that he had given me this explanation. And so from there, my journey with him started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, that's an interesting point because obviously anyone who now studies Islam sees that, you know, the killing of innocent human beings, this is something that is against Islam. So even if somebody's in a situation that now they are weak, it doesn't justify because some people some people do that. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't justify for someone to go ahead and ki take innocent life, right? Non-combatants and whatnot, right. right? Right. But in combat, you have the just war theory. This is something that even before this term even came about, just war theory, you had it in Islam, right? Right. Where Prophet Muhammad he would send out his uh, his Khalid ibn Walids and others, and they would have a list of what the do's and don'ts. How to engage in, exactly. in combat, right? Exactly. And you were to leave the innocent non-combatants, people in the places of worship, uh, houses of worship. All these things were were safeguarded. And exactly. This, and this is exactly. Amazing. It's amazing that you're pointing that out because these things that the Prophet instituted to his companions, to his armies, came 1,400 years, even way before the so-called Geneva Convention. Yeah. Uh, norms ever came into existence. Mm -hmm. Islam through the Prophet, they were already instituted in in the commands in the constitution of the Prophet of the do's and don'ts that Muslims should and should not do. So then now you're s learning these things and you're saying what that they make sense. Like so, you were telling me that finally, like okay, after these things are explained to you, you're thinking like okay, it's. Uh, it's time. Should I accept Islam? Should I take, take my shahada? When am I going to take it? Because pretty much everything that was explained to you, you already believed it anyway? Exactly. Exactly. When Damir was explaining to me about the pillars of Islam, about the articles of faith particularly and especially, he told me about the belief in one God, Allah, the belief in the angels, the belief in the scriptures, the belief in the prophets and messengers, the day of judgment and the decree of the good and the bad, I said to Damir, Damir, I already believe in all of these things. You like, I believe in it already. Exactly, automatically, from my Catholic upbringing, I already had it in me. Yeah. And I already believed in these articles. So that itself made my entry to Islam even much faster and easier. But what about now in Catholicism, you have all the saints, a lot of saint worship, worship of Jesus, Trinity, crucifixion. What about those things? Yeah, those those things, you know, um, they are still there very commonly until this very day, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very sad that the people, unfortunately, they are being led like ignorant lambs, blindfolded, as, a, as, as, as it says in the Gospels, dumb, deaf, and blind. And it is the reality, sadly, but Alhamdulillah, Allah, open the opportunity for me to learn about Islam mm -hmm. and get my all my misunderstandings cleared out. But did you, at that point, did you believe Jesus was God? I was I, still believing it, but when Damir clarified all of these points that Jesus is not, there is no Trinity, God is only one, Jesus is not God or the Son of God, or the Holy Spirit is not God, Yeah, but rather, you know, is the angel Gabriel a messenger that administered all the prophets in the Old Testament, that Mary herself, also the mother of Jesus, is not the mother of a god or a goddess herself, yeah. or as they call her, the, the goddess of the universe. When all these things were cleared out, you know, it made sense. I always, I've always believed as a Catholic that there is one God only, but however, it was mixed with the Trinity. Yeah. And Jesus was a prophet as well, as is in the Gospels very clearly. I already believed it because I used to read the Bible and I could understand it very clearly in my language. It clearly says it in yes. the Gospel that this is a prophet. Exactly. Jesus yes. of Nazareth. Yes. A prophet. Yes, in it, the Gospel of Matthew particularly. Yeah. It is all over the place that the people believed that this was a new prophet uh, being sent to the, to, to the people of Israel. Yeah. So then now... 
Prophet Muhammad comes with the Quran to set things right because now people, even the earlier Christians, didn't believe that he he was a part of a trinity or many of the things that had developed over time that we have today. Council right. Nasiya, then other council and all these things, people, you know, trying to figure out is he divine, isn't he? And then the schism and all these things happening. Right. So now here comes the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Who didn't call people to worship himself, he called people to worship the God that Jesus worshipped. Exactly. And to clear things up about Jesus. Exactly. So now that message is coming to you. There had to be some confusion at that time because now this is made clear and you're like, that makes sense. I'm with this. Exactly. And you know what? I'm glad that you're mentioning that because when Damir gave me the Quran in English yeah. and I began reading it, it began making sense immediately to me. Mm -hmm. It's as if the book was speaking to me yeah. directly and connecting with me. And remember I mentioned to you that Jesus what is, and his mother are two of the most important pillars of faith in Catholicism mm -hmm. for every Catholic. Yeah. And so when I found Jesus and his mother, peace be upon them both, in the Quran, it was like a, 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 a an explosion in my mind. Wow. That, wow, this book mentions what I believe already. Jesus being a prophet, his blessed mother, being a righteous virgin, who gave birth and he was born miraculously and he did all the miracles wow i said i recognized that this was the truth <laughs> that was my reaction and and there were times that i when i would read the quran i would cry literally i would cry because my heart and my senses they recognized the truth in this book and that made me make the quran part of myself part of my being even more just as the bible it you know was part of me as well as well as the teachings of jesus mm -hmm. and this is very digestible this is very because it goes with what we call the fitra you know the fitra now yes that's the innate human disposition it just when something comes now it just makes sense with your heart mind body with your with a, a, every limb your dna everything that in you the truth comes it just connects with it. it's that's why it's no coincidence that you have amongst Latinos, uh, those who are exposed to Islam, yeah. it is the fastest growing way of life. Yeah, It's connecting with their fitra. So do, exactly. you, be do you believe if uh, more people in Honduras, Central America, if now they got to get exposure to Islam, they would also, because there's these commonalities, and yes. now yes. they would also uh, yes. connect I, like I you did? I strongly believe it because yeah. I have seen it in my travels back, to, back home. Yeah, The people already, they believe that there is one God. Yes. They love Jesus. They love the Bible. They love the uh, the Virgin Mary. They love it all. They express it very clearly. It is natural to them. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, more dawa work, more, you know, m more of that work is is really needed in in Central American countries. Yeah. In comparison to other countries in South America, which, which is well, I mean, it's, Islam is growing fast over there as well, mm -hmm. as, as in Mexico as well. But Islam is, I, I believe that Islam is really, really needed for my people because I, I strongly believe that Islam is the only way for people to truly to be guided to a to the right course, the right direction, to truly worship the one true God that Jesus worshipped. And he believed and he praised and he glorified as in John 17, 3. And this is life eternal. So they may know you, the only true God and Jesus whom you have sent. That in itself, you know, Eddie, just this powerful verse in John 17, 3. And in many other instances in the, throughout the Gospels. Made me realize that now as a Muslim, Eddie, I can understand the what the words of Jesus even much better than when I was a Catholic. And I believe that every revert to Islam, particularly that whether it be Latino or English speaking or and other than that, I believe that they they will all share something similar to what I am saying that we understand the Bible better than the Christians themselves. Mm -hmm. And this is a fact. Wow, this is powerful. Yeah. 
So then John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus, who you sent. Exactly, meaning Jesus is the messenger, the one who was sent by the one true God. Yeah. And Jesus very clearly exemplified this idea that he was sent, that he didn't do things out of his own will, but rather he did by what he heard from above, what he yeah. was commanded to do. He the, did the will of the one true God. The sender is the one sending so the sender and the one sent are not the same exactly they're two complete different different individuals and then this always this verse from the bible reminds me of the shahada almost, exactly right because la ilaha illallah and this is what you had to say to to accept islam yes so let's move on to that so now this is very very similar to john 17 3 that you bear witness that there's no nothing worthy of worship except the one true god mm -hmm. and jesus is saying here there is that you are the only true God and Shahada that you're testifying that there's no nothing worthy of worship except the one true God and Muhammad is the final messenger at, at Jesus' time you would have declared that Jesus he is, is the, the messenger. he is the messenger exactly that makes sense yeah it makes total sense yeah so then what did it finally you said it was like Christmas Eve or something and yeah so uh, th in 2004 yeah through, throughout that time for 2003 when I started reading with Damir and he started teaching me and I, as I was educating myself and through the Quran as well and he invited me to the masjid as well and I loved the experience of it it reminded me how Jesus worshipped as well and as I told you I saw the Muslims bowing and prostrating on their faces immediately it lit up the light bulb in my head and I said man I love this because it gave me so much peace when you saw the Muslims praying exactly that reminded you of how Jesus prayed exactly. from what you read of the Bible exactly how he prostrated himself on his face on the ground calling to the to his Lord the one he worshiped so all of many things happened and so when this time came in December I already had enough sufficient understanding that this Quran is the truth that there is only one God but Allah and I believe that in reality Muhammad is the messenger of Allah as it's stated in the Quran very loud and clear it couldn't be no more ambiguous than that just as Jesus said that God there is only one God and he is the messenger of God mm. so one week before Christmas Eve I was sitting in bed and I was I began to reflect and brainstorm when should I become a Muslim and I kept on thinking and I I remember, oh, you know, the 24th is going to be Christmas Eve. Midnight, we celebrate. The Catholics also make Mass at midnight, celebrating Christmas on, at the turn of the, of the clock at midnight. And so I said, I'm going to become, I'm going to take my Shahada in this day. And I looked at the calendar, and it came to be that in 2004, December the 24th, fell on a Friday. And immediately I made my decision when I went back to work. I met Damir and I told him, Damir, I want to take my Shahada. Damir was perplexed and surprised. He said, Neil, are you okay? Are you sure? You don't want to take more time to study and think about it? I said, no. I am sure this is the truth. I said to him, I want to take my Shahada and I want to do it on the, on the 24th, on Friday, on Jumu'ah. He said, okay. So let's meet on Friday, he said. And we met when Friday came. And uh, when we went to the masjid, anyways, I'll cut it short. We went for the Friday prayer, and uh, I enjoyed it. And the imam was about to leave. I remember that <laughs> when we came before the, the the khutbah, we went to the fourth floor, and I tell we tell the brother in, sitting in the office, this brother wants to take shahada, pointing at me. And the brother said, "Okay, okay, I'll tell him." Anyways, when we were done. The imam was about to walk away from the member, and everybody was ready to walk down. And the mirror realized, Neil, come on, let's go. This guy forgot to tell the imam, what did I tell you? Come on, let's go. Hmm. And we stopped the imam before he left, and we told him, the Amir said, this brother wants to take shahada. Okay. The imam called everybody back on the fifth floor, and he said, brothers, brothers, please, stop. Come back. There's a brother who wants to take shahada. Everybody came back. And so the imam he told me, you know, you're taking a great step. You're making a big decision in your life of becoming a Muslim. But I want to ask you, did anybody, con you know, 
convinced you or brainwashed you to become a Muslim? I said, no. Did anybody offer you money? I said, no. Are you doing this out of your own will? I said, yes, because I believe it's true. Okay. Then we're going to say it in Arabic, he said. And then we will say it in English. I got ahead of, ahead of the imam and I told him, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. So he laughed at me and he said, okay, you know it. You already had yes. practiced and memorized the, the, the kalima. The, yes. Yes. Wow. Yes, I already know the testimony of faith already. Yeah. And so we went through it, both of us, in Arabic. And then we went in English through it. And someone in the audience, in the floor, they, they shouted takbir very loud. And the whole floor shook with one, Allahu Akbar. Three times, takbir Allahu Akbar, takbir Allahu Akbar. It was mm -hmm. so powerful. So God Just, is the greatest. God exactly, the greatest. to, to yes. testify that God is the greatest indeed. And that's a powerful call in reality. And so, at that moment, I felt that I had reached the peak of a mountain. That's the feeling that I had immediately after I took that testimony of faith. And I feel that I was victorious that was that feeling and in my heart I felt like a flame was burning inside of my heart ferociously mm -hmm. I told the mirror after that the mirror I feel like I, w I live in Islam I feel like I walk in Islam I feel like I sleep in Islam like I sleep in Islam everything in Islam and that was my my shahada right there and then and that was 18 years ago huh yes 18 years ago yeah wow amazing you gave it. Thank you for sharing that uh, with us. Inshallah, this can be a benefit for so many other Latinos and just people in general who are ser searching to know the purpose of life, why they've been created, why they're here, clear up some of these misconceptions, especially around Jesus, those who love Jesus, and they find out we as Muslims, we have a deep, profound love for him and his mother, and this whole, all the misconceptions that revolve around him is cleared up in Islam, who he really was. His mission of calling people to worship the Creator, not the creation, not himself, but the one who he prostrated to as Muslims do. All of that's in Islam. Yeah. They can have it just like uh, you found it. And hopefully with your story, can inspire more people to read the Quran. Yeah. What advice would you give for someone out there from Honduras, Central America? They're tuning in and they want to know why they've been created. Their, their life is in shambles and they're on you know the cervezas or whatever the case and it's just like upside down they're searching for more what would you tell them okay i will say it in spanish because you're referring to my people yes my spanish-speaking people the first thing that i will tell them is oh mi gente de honduras yo soy hondureño yo soy musulmán y yo les aconsejo de buscar el islam de investigar qué es el Islam. Porque el Islam en, verde, en realidad es la guía del Todopoderoso. Y es la única guía. Y esto es lo que se, en realidad les salvará. Yo los llamo al Islam, o oh mi gente, y a todos los demás latinos. Que adoren al único Dios y se sometan a Él únicamente. Y que crean en el profeta Muhammad. So basically what I said in, in summary to my people is that I, as a man from, from their folk, from Honduras, I am a Muslim. And I am calling them, inviting them to Islam, to research about Islam, find out about Islam. Because Islam indeed is the true way, it is the true religion, and this is what will guide them and what will give them safety and salvation in the next life. Mm. by worshipping and submitting to the one true God, Allah, and to testify and believe that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And th and this is uh, any Spanish-speaking people. It can be Puerto Rican, he can be Mexican, he can be Guatemalan. Uh, they all understand what you just said. Exactly. They all understand because we, one beautiful thing, Eddie, about all of us Latin Americans, whether it be from Mexico, from the Caribbean, from Central America, from South America, is that we all consider ourselves brothers because we speak the same language because we relate yeah because we understand each other mm -hmm. that's deep wow inshallah they take heed to your beautiful message and for those watching if you'd like a copy of 
the verbatim word of God Almighty Allah. This is in English. We might have one in Spanish. Go to the deanshow.com. We'll get this sent to you as a gift from me to you. And if you have any questions, don't be shy. Call. Tell them that Eddie sent me at 1-800-662-ISLAM. Call the number right now and ask your questions before you get caught up in all the other worldly things out there. There's a deep desire. Your heart is yearning. And what he's talked about, the story, you know it makes sense. It connects with your fitra also, your innate disposition. So before the time, what time comes? The time of death and you depart this life. Then it's too late. You can't go back to retake the test. No, you're being tested right now. What are you going to do? So go ahead and take the opportunity. Get yourself a free copy of the Quran and call us. Ask your questions. Tell them Eddie sent you. And we'll see you next time. Until then, subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that notification bell. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. Center. So we, so we transforming this from people worshiping the creation to worshiping the Allah Creator. Allah. Allah bless your efforts, Eddie. How you doing, brother? Good. How you doing, man? How is brother doing? All right. So as you can see, we're getting to work, and we need your support. So go ahead and help us to get this where it's top notch, inshallah.